Hello and welcome back dear friends at Lit E City YouTube channel the one stop destination for your preparation related with exams like NTA NAT dear friends in our series questions that matter we handle questions that are based on that are prepared keeping in mind the standard uh, the level of NAT and especially these questions are prepared uh, especially for the advanced level, the level of JRF. And in today's series, the questions which we will deal is from the topic of literary criticism, that is unit 8 of NTA's prescribed syllabus. These questions is, are basically framed on an advanced level, digging deep into the classical text and bringing you the latest information. So here is our first question which is taken from Plato and the question reads Plato's iron it outlines the theory of poetry as inspiration it was uh, in this book that uh, with a form in a form of dialogue Plato presented his opinion regarding poetry as uh, inspiration and the dialogue takes place between uh, Aeon and Socrates which was it is not actually the historical or we can say the teacher of Plato but rather an imaginary character based on opinions of Socrates. So who is Aeon in this particular book? Our options are first option is he is a poet, second one is a historian, third option is a professional reciter and the last option is a painter. So this particular person and Socrates have a dialogue between them regarding the nature and art of poetry. And the correct answer is that Aeon is a professional reciter of poems, especially he is a uh, the term used for that person is a rhapsod, a professional performer, oral performer of epics written by Homer and he specializes in uh, recitation of uh, epics by Homer. According to Plato, after this dialogue, Socrates points out that what he knows about Homer, uh, why he calls himself a specialist. Uh, poetry is a divine inspiration, a form of divine madness. This is what Plato concludes. Our next question uh, in this series, dear friends, is that in the medieval European curriculum of various universities, the standard uh, curriculum included seven liberal arts. Now, these seven liberal arts were divided into two parts. There was a trivium, uh, which is of made of three subjects, and a quadrium, which is made of four subjects. You have to tell me which among the following options is not one of the subjects of the trivium. So the first option is grammar. The second one is rhetoric. The third one is logic and the fourth one is philosophy out of these four uh, subjects there was one which was not part of this trivium now dear friends uh, uh, these seven subjects were considered to be the part of liberal arts many more subjects were later added uh, during the uh, we can say uh, after medieval period and in the new modern period but if we talk about this trivium, the right answer is philosophy. It was quite later that philosophy was added as a subject. If we talk about this quadrium, the four subjects which were included in it were geometry, arithmetic, music and astronomy. So these three, uh, these four plus those three, uh, grammar, rhetoric and logic they all make the seven liberal arts. Coming to our next question, considered, considered as a pioneering masterpiece, a very important work in the comparative criticism, Dryden's preface to fables, which was, which was one of very influential work in the history of English criticism, 
it has discussion on some of ancient and some uh, we can say english poets not contemporary but uh, earlier english poets who among these once again is not one of the poets uh, which uh, dryden discuss in this particular preface so our options are first one is homer second one is second option is virgil third option is chaucer and the last option is spencer you have to tell out of these uh, three four poets which one is which one is that which is not discussed by dryden uh, so if we look at the correct answer it is friends spencer uh, dryden talks a lot about homer and virgil and uh, he compares them there is another poet ovid uh, on which there is a discussion in fact he compares ovid and virgil with chaucer also and tries to prove which is very famous line when he tries to show that chaucer is also uh, in par with these great classical poets the famous phrase here is god's plenty that is in chaucer's poetry our next question dear friend is that uh, longinus the famous roman critic he distinguishes the true sublime and false sublime false sublime is that which appears to be sublime but which is not actually sublime by pointing vices by pointing defects of a false sublime style which among these is not one of the defects one of the falsities found in uh, which are those works which are not truly sublime so our options are turgidity of language these are this is basically translation of what longinus has used second is puerility third is parenthesis and fourth is dead metaphors in fact longinus uh, not only points out the quality of uh, a great work which is sublime and longinus was that critic that classical critic which greatly influenced both neo classicals and the romantic ones which is rather uh, we can say strange thing but uh, his concept of sublime uh, appealed the romantics also out of these four the correct option dear friend is dead metaphors yes he talks about defects of style now turgidity means uh, boasting very uh, greatly without any requirement when a poet boasts that is turgidity puerility is meanness of style parenthesis is mismatching of style and defects of style other kind of defects but it is not dead metaphors about which he talks who translated nicolas bolu la art poetic which is written originally in french uh, the art of poetry a formal statement of the principles of neo classicism Fran french classicism in english it was actually this book which itself was inspired by uh, roman poet horace uh, art poetica art poetica it became a standard book a benchmark of rules according with according to which uh, the literature of this particular era of the 17th century and uh, the later part of uh, first part of the 18th century was judged now the question is who translated this particular book into english our option are options are alexander pope second one is abraham cowley third option is john dryden and the last option is john denham they all belong to somehow the same period though cowley is rather earlier and uh, alexander pope is last among them and along with denham and dryden they all have done some sort of translation work also but the correct answer that the person who translated la poetic is none other than john dryden dryden was also a prolific translator in fact in his later part of uh, creative life he was more keen on translating and also pointing out that as a translator he is not a very competent person our next question is that thomas rymer 
who was a famous neoclassical critic. He was one of the earliest critic of Shakespearean tragedies, particularly lambasting a play by calling it a bloody farce without salt or savor. Which is the which of these uh, Shakespearean tragedy he is talking about? Rhymer is famous or rather infamous because of his attacks on the theater, and he is also against Shakespearean uh, tragedies because obviously Shakespeare Shakespeare didn't follow the classical unities and other uh, other such kind of theories. So our options are first option is Macbeth, second one is King Lear. Third one is Hamlet and the last one is Othello. Now, um, actually he finds fault with all of these plays, but this phase, uh, famous phrase that this is not a serious tragedy, he is talking about Othello. Now, uh, this particular uh, work in which he criticizes Shakespeare is a short view of tragedy which was published in 1693 which was a severe criticism of English drama according to him which was quite immoral. Our next question is who is the writer of books like The Impartial Critic published in 1693, The Grounds of Criticism in Poetry published in 1704 and all these works they promoted neoclassical ideals. Our options are John Dennis, second is Charles Gildon, third option is Joseph Edison and the last option is Henry Felton. In fact, it was the time when along with uh, John Dryden, there were many other critics who were promoting, who were espousing neoclassical trends, who tried to emulate uh, the principle laid by or favored by the Augustans uh, uh, like Horace. So this particular book, it was penned by John Dennis, the famous uh, critic, the famous intellectual of this period who wrote The Crowns of Critics in Poetry. It is another path-breaking work in which he, uh, he concentrates his uh, logical energies on uh, the focus of rationality in literature. Rules of, uh, look at this statement find by John Dennis. Rules of Aristotle are nothing but nature and good sense reduced to a method. So according to him, if a poet, if a writer follows what Aristotle dictates, only then the writer is writing literature. The next question, dear friend, is Edmund Burke in his seminal work philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful points out that beauty produces the feeling of pleasure while sublime produces. So basically he distinguishes between these two feelings beautiful and sublime. Beautiful is rather a normal and it, it gives us pleasure. What does sublime gives? Our options are feeling of anxiety, second is feeling of delight, third option is feeling of ecstasy and the last is feeling of fear. Now uh, like Longinus he has also pointed out uh, the importance of sublime and uh, it was his work and other works of that time which I have already mentioned that basically inspired the romantic writers because it was not mere beauty but it was something sublime and actually he talks about that sublime produced feeling of delight. So beauty, feeling of pleasure which is rather controlled while feeling of delight. It may also cause by something which is dreadful. So something which make us afraid uh, can also give us feeling of delight when you find that we are now uh, out of danger, out of risk. This is what Burke has to tell about it. The next question is the Greek word hypos, hypsos, sorry, hypsos stands for this quality of literary work. Uh, they, they try to find out that if a work has this quality or not and the, the options are 
फर्स्ट इज सबलिमिटी सेकेंड इज एक्सेजरेशन थर्ड इज टेस्ट एंड द लास्ट वन इज होलनेस now out of these they they talk about this hip sauce which is an important quality which not all the works possess and the correct answer is yes hip sauce is sublimity which is once again found in rare works and if there is hip sauce or sublim sublimity in a work the work will become immortal the next question is shakespeare was the homer or father of our dramatic poets johnson ben johnson was the virgil the pattern of elaborate writing who is the author of this famous statement now friends we know very well this dichotomy between shakespeare and ben johnson ben johnson is considered to be a classicist while shakespeare a typical romantic now who uh, basically gave this evaluation of these poets was it john dryden second option is samuel johnson third one is astley collins and the last option is alexander pope now we all know that they have contributed something or other to shakespearean criticism but this particular evaluation of these uh, two writers it was given by it was given by john dryden okay uh in the very famous work by john dryden essay of dramatic poesy published in 1668 you must know that it is basically it comprises it comprises of four uh, persons including in a discussion on the state of uh, drama and then comparative merits of ancient and moderns uh, there is also discussion on importance of meter or rhyme and then also between merits of french and english theater neander the mouthpiece of uh, uh, dryden himself he defends english drama next question is presented in the form of a dialogue once again we have third question we have already seen ian which is a dialogue between socrates and ian then dramatic poesy and once again another work which is in the form of a dialogue between gilbert and ernest the critic as artist is a key text of aestheticism these two persons are sitting in a library and they uh, one person ernest is asking question and gilbert is uh, elaborating on his ideas of aestheticism who is the author first is option is oscar wilde second option is william morris third is walter peter and the last option is henry james all these once again are associated with this particular aesthetic movement and they all are uh, critics or we can say propounder of the theory or the principles of aestheticism but the correct answer the critic as an as artist is a long dialogic essay by oscar wilde the next question is who translated ars poetica by horace for the first time in english ars poetica its influence on uh, uh, criti tradition of criticism throughout the europe is uh, we can say most most important after his total it is actually horace now horace himself was a poet and he not only introduced many dictums of classicism but he has also given the yardstick through which a work's greatness can be measured so our options are first one is john dryden second one is john lilly third is ben johnson and the last is alexander pope they were somehow very much influenced by this particular critic and his work and in fact uh, uh, alexander pope's essay criticism essay is we can say a replica a softened version of horace Uh, dictum but first time who translated ars poetica it is ben johnson the next question is which poet critic in his defense of the poetic art observes uh, there are many poet critics who have seen this that the art of poetry has been criticized especially by the philosopher but he states that poetry has fallen from his status as the 
there was a time when it ha it was at the highest estimation of the learning but when the poet critic is writing it has become the laughing stock of children he tries to defend uh, the uh, first evaluation that poetry is one of the highest estimations of learning was it sydney dryden shelley or ben johnson they all are poets poets of prominence and also they are critics and somehow sydney dryden shelley all of these especially they have defended uh, poetry against various charges but it was that who wrote that what a uh, downfall poetry has received it was none other than philip sydney who among the following with respect to the substance or the subject matter called poetry a type of feigned history now the, it is a very important uh, difference made by this particular critic uh, let's look at the options first is francis bacon the next is roser ashcham third one is philip sydney and the last one is ben johnson out of these there is one person who consider that poetry is not history it is basically plain history and here its importance lies the correct answer is francis bacon he in his book uh, the advancement of learning in the second uh, part of this book he uh, in a very detailed manner describes the art of poetry and he says that there are two uh, basically division substance or the matter and style if uh, we talk about style poetry belongs to the rhetoric or parts of speech arts of speech and if we talk about substance it is about feigned history because history can be very boring it is factual so the poet present history as if something is happening or with some uh, little we can say swerve to create interest that is why he called it a feigned history the next question is in the introduction of which dramatic work the writer expresses his desire to vindicate tragedy from the small esteem or rather infamy which it undergoes at this day almost similar jaise abhi dekha humne one poet has already defended poetry and this one is the second one in which the poet is uh, uh, trying to vindicate the art of tragedy so the first play is all for love by john dryden second is sejanus third one is samson agonistus and the fourth one is cato by uh, edison sejanus by uh, who is the writer of sejanus you must know that this person has uh, written very famous comedies but he has also written classical tragedies you have to find out there are two or three of his works which are based on roman models of tragedies if we talk about this particular line tragedy from uh, that he wants to vindicate it is milton's uh, close uh, text with milton's uh, tragedy samson agonistus which was published along with paradise regained that in this play in the introduction to this play that milton writes that he is writing this work to vindicate the art of tragedy <clears throat> uh, it is uh, it is also this particular introductory part is also known as of that sort of dramatic poem which is called tragedy okay friends that is all in our presentation for the day these 15 16 questions are uh, very important not only the questions please also uh, give some importance to the options and the works mentioned in these question i hope you will do your best in the coming exams thank you friends